morning. Welcome. Uh, for a few announcements, draw your attention to um, the bulletin. Specifically, next Sunday, November 19th, will be one service at 10 a.m. Uh, it will be our Thanksgiving meal um, Sunday, so uh, you're welcome to come and worship together and then spend time in fellowship with uh, food and uh, cheer together after the service. Uh, it will also be our pledge Sunday, so you're welcome to bring your pledges that day to be dedicated and given to God as we offer them. Um, also, that same Sunday, the full day, full of joy and worship and, and fellowship, uh, is our charge conference that afternoon around 3 p.m. So you're invited to come and attend charge conference. You'll get an opportunity to meet our district superintendent, Melissa Drake, also to hear and, and to uh, share in the joys and ministries together that we have here as a, as a church family. So uh, come and attend and enjoy part of that as well. And then the following Sunday, November 26th, will also be one service. It'll be late this Sunday, um, on that Sunday as well. You're going to see a few of them coming up. It seems like quite a bit of 10 o'clock ones, but a lot of that's the holidays. Uh, Thanksgiving and, and Christmas Eve and New Year's, so um, that's on the horizon ahead coming up. So if you're wondering why there's so many of them all of a sudden, uh, that is just the way it's going to work out with the seasons and holidays. Um, also, Tuesday, a reminder, it is our Applebee's fundraiser for the youth uh, for their mission trip all day, anytime that day. Uh, you can go and attend and um, share in helping them fundraise for that. Are there other announcements this morning? What about joys or concerns? Things to lift up to the Lord. Remind you that there are also um, cards in the pews should you ever have a prayer request that you're welcome to write them down and share them from the offering plate and they'll get to me some way. Okay. Any joys or concerns? Well, let us continue in worship if you'll stand and join as we lift up our prayers and song to the Lord. <laughs>
Jesus of Nazareth. In scripture, we will hear of a woman who gave her last coin away, and he pointed her out, but she did not say, go and do likewise. So we cannot help but wonder, what did you point her to ask? Why does this one have so little when others have so much? Did you point her to help us? Did you point her out to help us see the injustice that led to her suffering? Maybe. So today, for her and for you and for every person who cannot afford to give to God and put food on the table, we offer our gifts. We pray that you would use them for your good. Right what is wrong, balance the systems of injustice, and use these gifts to build the world that we can only imagine, but you can bring forth. In hope we pray. Amen. Our first scripture passage comes from Leviticus chapter 19, 9 through 10, and chapter 25, 8 through 12. So hear these words. When you harvest your land's produce, you must not harvest all the way to the edge of your field. And don't gather up every remaining bit of your harvest. Also, do not pick your vineyard clean or gather up all the grapes that have fallen there. Leave these items to the poor and the immigrant, for I am the Lord your God. Count off seven weeks of years, that is, seven times seven, so that the seven weeks of years totals forty-nine years. Then have the trumpet blown on the tenth day of the seventh month. Have the trumpet blown throughout your land on the day of reconciliation. You will make the fiftieth year holy, proclaiming freedom throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It will be a jubilee year for you. Each of you must return to your family, property, and to your extended family. For the fiftieth year will be a jubilee year for you. Do not plant, do not harvest the second growth, and do not gather from the freely growing vines, because it is a jubilee. It will be holy to you. You can eat only the produce directly out of the field. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <coughs>
them be put to shame and confusion who seek my life. Let them turn back, the 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 back because of their shame and say, Aha, aha. They all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. They those who love your salvation say evermore, God is great. cheat widows out of their homes, and to show off, they say long prayers. They will be judged most harshly. Jesus sat across from the collection box for the temple treasury and observed how the crowd gave their money. Many rich people were throwing in lots of money. One poor widow came forward and put in two small copper coins worth a penny. Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I assure you that this poor widow has put in more than anyone who has been putting money in the treasury. But all of them are giving out of their spare change. She, from her hopeless poverty, has given everything that she had, even what she needed to live on. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God, we thank you for your word, your word that brings life into us, that convicts and guides us, your word that teaches us. We ask that your spirit might be with all who hear this today, and be with the words that I speak, that they be your words given to your people. Amen. Mother Teresa wrote, It's not how much we give, but how much love we put into giving. I know I am touching the living body of Christ in the broken bodies of the hungry and the suffering. For each one of them is Jesus in disguise. She also said that being unwanted, unloved, uncared for, forgotten by everybody, I think that that is a much greater hunger, a much greater poverty than the person who has nothing to eat. We are continuing our series on stewardship this week with remembering our stories and releasing those to God and now reimagining what they can look like, what it can look like to see as God sees and God's vision in the world and how we are a part of that. And I love to, these quotes, excuse me, from Mother Teresa, who uh, pours out her heart. She spent her entire life and ministry caring for the people in Calcutta, day after day, working to serve them, well, to teach the children, to educate them, to feed them, and then also she was a nurse, so she cared for their wounds and their physical bodies. But day after day, as she labored endlessly in love, it never changed the poverty level there. It never changed the amount of those who needed her care. It seemed endless work day after day. Later on, in the end of, towards the end of her ministry, Mother Teresa wrote in her journal, a most heart-wrenching story of great desolation of the soul in which she called out and said that she didn't even know if God was with her. She knew about God, but it felt so distant and alone and as though day after day nothing was mattering or making a difference. Mother Teresa cared for those around her and spent her heart doing the work of God knowing that it wasn't going to change. That as Jesus says that the poor will always be with you, yet she also talked about, and I, and I love that last quote about, it wasn't just poverty, but it was seeing people as they were, as humans, as the humanity of a person loved by God, 
as, a, as someone who deserves to be known by name, to have a story, to be connected to, and to be loved. And that's what our entire stewardship uh, sermon series has been about, about uh, listening to God, remembering our stories, and seeing one another as humans. It's not just about money and, and, and giving, but it's about a heart that is following after God's love to give to one another. And this morning's scripture passage, especially in Mark, is a story actually of heart-wrenching pain and grief when we look and we dive into the, to the story a little more. Oftentimes it's preached of oh, wonderful good news about the widow giving all that she had. And that's a great sermon and it's a great interpretation of it, that we are to be like this woman and to give all that we have to God, to care for and to show that uh, our love for one another. But if we dive deeper, we will see that this woman's poverty was caused because the laws that God had in place to protect her were not being followed by the same people that were to follow them and to care for the widower and the poor and the orphan. That just right above here at the very first verse, Jesus points out the teachers, the Pharisees, those who were wearing showy robes and gladly feasting at the finest banquet, and yet at the same time, unjustly harming a widow that they were told that they were to protect and care for. The Leviticus passage, we started with that one earlier in the service, because in Leviticus, is one of the laws that God had given to the Jewish uh, people to follow as a way to protect those who needed food. Do not, when you go and leave during harvesting time in the field, do not collect everything that is in the field, but to leave some of the outlying areas so that those who do not have food can go and clean it for themselves and have food to eat. An example of this is found in the book of Ruth. You may be familiar with the story of Ruth, this is what Ruth does. When she goes to Boaz's uh, field, she goes with the rest of those who have followed past the harvesters to collect the extra that was left over so that she could bring food home to eat. There was also a law that they were to follow about on the 50th year, the jubilee. The, the next part of it, I guess, that on the 50th year, there was to be a jubilee, a celebration of all that God has blessed them with, in which those who were enslaved would be set free, those who were in debt, those who were to be wiped clean, they were to go back to their home. Property was returned to those who had it, and there was rejoicing and a great celebration. But also during this, very importantly, they were specific about not collecting from the earth some of the harvest, the first harvest they were not to collect. And that goes along with stewardship, not of just caring for the people, but God is caring for creation, the earth, to allow it to, to reproduce, uh, to reform uh, all of its nutrients, and to go through a cycle of rebirth as well. So this jubilee was not just for the people there, but it was for all of God's creation, for the earth, for the very dirt that God has created. They were to give a year of rest, a time to renew and restart. And this is what it means to then reimagine what it would look like if all of this was followed, because it wasn't what Jesus was referring to the Pharisees. This widow gave all that she had because the very entity that she was giving to took away from her her livelihood. Instead of caring for the widows, they would confiscate if they had any sort of income left after their spouse died, and then their, if, their, if their father was no longer living, the widow had nowhere else to turn. They weren't allowed to work, they couldn't have jobs, they, they had to rely on either their husband or their father. And when they passed it, it was the responsibility of the temple of the, those who were there in, in the churches to gather and to care for the widow or the orphan and the poor. But that's not what was happening. Instead, they would confiscate it and maybe give the widow something of that. The best example I, I heard this week or that I could in equivalent of what this widow gave uh, was as if uh, she purchased a Costco membership, went and bought a huge bag of groceries, then came and delivered it to the temple, put it in the treasury, and received one box of mac and cheese in return. 
that would be an equivalent, the best that I can give you, of an understanding of what is taking place here. So she gives all that she has, but all that she has isn't even a, a much to begin with because it's confiscated by the same people who were there to care for the widows. So there are a lot of grief and a lot of injustices going on in this passage. It's not just about giving, but it's about uh, poverty and, and the injustice of those who were meant to care and the structure that was built and laws that God put in place that were not being followed that increased the pain and suffering that this poor widow had to endure. One of the most uh, famous stories that I love about John Wesley, the, the founder of Methodism, was when, when John Wesley would walk down the street, he might start off the day with changing his pockets, but he was so giving, he would come home with empty pockets because everyone he meet that was in need, he would give to them. And John Wesley also was notorious for being kicked out of churches. Uh, when he began early on, churches kicked him out because they didn't like what he had to say. And one of his big and strongest messages about grace and love was look at the people outside your doors on the streets that you are ignoring. That the church had become so comfortable, comfortable in their, their rituals and their laws and their ways that they no longer looked beyond that and perceived those who needed their care. Uh, a similar example to this is here, here in Mark. I, I feel bad for the, the priests and, and the rulers because they, they come off as being the bad ones in this passage, and that's not the case either. It's almost as if they've just lost their way. At one point, they may have done well with following these laws, and maybe they got caught up in the show of things, of feeling important, or they, they just became blinded by what was in front of them. And they needed to be re-brought back, refocused to those still struggling beyond their walls and on the streets and those in their care. This widow probably attended services every single week. She was dedicated to God and following the laws. She was one of their own and yet treated as though an outsider, unwelcomed and unloved and used and abused by the same system that God implemented to care for with justice and love. We have an opportunity this week to reimagine. If you were to release all of the things that have set you apart from listening to God, to remember your stories and to look at back at your life to see where God has been and what has kept you from being a good a caregiver of the gifts God has given to you, to release them, to release those emotions and those attachments and those worries, and now this week to reimagine what God can do with your life and the ministry of God's whole church here together and what that might look like. Will it look like caring for those outside of our doors? And maybe it will be like Mother Teresa. We care and we care and we care and it still is there, but you care and you show love so that those might know that they are worthy of the love of God. And maybe it's a different story. One where you see the peace that was meant to be on earth instead of the chaos and war. We imagine it differently when we look at this story and we see that there was really injustice in the midst of it. That we look at the world around us and we see that injustice. We see suffering, those who do not have food to eat, those who are hungry, those who are suffering under abuse, those around us each day who are forgotten or pushed aside as unworthy of God's love. I want to remind you again of this quote from Mother Teresa. It's being unwanted, unloved, uncared for, forgotten by everybody, I think that that is much greater hunger, a much greater poverty than the person who has nothing to eat. John Wesley believed that all persons were safe to work, even though sitting outside the door hungry. And Methodism grew on this ability to love and to care for one another. It was such a radical change than what had been going on. It was a huge change of grace and God's abundant love pouring out so that they lived lives in a work of, of holiness to, to grow in their own spiritual lives, to grow in being good and loving and kind and doing no harm to others. This is our Methodist history, and part of it is, is then trusting that God's love is more than what we see here in this earth, that we are called to be a part of that story, to reimagine how we can change and be the ones to show light on those who do not yet know who God is, knowing someone by name, calling 
up with them, sharing in their story, being a part of that story, those are ways of being good stewards of what God has blessed us with. One of my final thought for you here, I shared a couple weeks ago my, my story about how uh, Patrick is amazing, my son is amazing at finances. And one of the things he's taught me over the years uh, that we've been married in, and I love this, is that he always says that giving is from the heart. If it's not from the heart, then you're not actually giving the way that you should be. Because if you give because the scripture tells you to, if you're tithing the 10% because you feel you ought to, then you're not fully living into the ability that God has for you of what it means to be loved and to share that love with one another. I can't give you that love. You have to experience that love yourself to grow in your heart to see that it's all about the heart. It's about being changed fully by God, living that out in our stories and in our lives, and reimagining what God can do with you and your story and our story together. What can it look like to fight for justice, to bring peace, to bring wholeness, to bring goodness and love, to do no harm, or to see those outside of you, the doors, as humans, have conversations, to feed the hungry, to welcome the outcast, to sit together and have a meal together. All of these are part of our call as the stewards of God, as God's creation of God's world, to bring together a heart that changes. Part of you. Nothing we do matters unless we do it for the Lord, and it is God who has changed our heart. It is all because of God's glory and goodness that we should respond out of that goodness and share that goodness with one another. We all have just enough that we share what we have with one another so that justice is made known and God's goodness and love is made known. Mother Teresa spent her entire ministry. She got burnt out on it, but she continued, not because she always saw the fruit of her work. She probably died and is still there because scripture even says that the poor will always be with you, but she continued because God loved her and she was taught to love one another, to, to love as God loved, and to share that with those around her. She worked for a while inside of a school building, and that's what started her ministry with the poor in Calcutta. She saw them outside the window. And she couldn't stand it any longer to be inside, separated by a wall, and not be out where the people were caring for them. She, she then talked to her, her bishop and, and, and got it all worked out so that her ministry then became more hands-on with those outside of the building, those who needed to know love and light. And she wasn't always welcome. She was not welcome necessarily by those she was trying to help, but she persisted, persisted in love. Not by force, not because she had to, but because her heart was changed by God's love. And that's what spread the good news. So reimagine. Reimagine how different a story would look if the widow was actually cared for by the laws that God had in place. Reimagine a world in which peace and justice is made known and not suffering and, and poverty and illness, but one of pureness and love. That's is what we have a call to do as, and a call and an opportunity to be a part of. That's where our stories mingle with one another's stories, mingles with the stories outside the wall, and mingle together with God's love and story for us. That's where we have the opportunity to rethink, to reimagine, and ask God to show us a new way, different than what we have seen before. Let us pray. God, it is you who love us. Your spirit pours out on us, and you call us to a life of following you, and a heart that follows after you to love one another, to see your people as you see them, beloved children. God, we know that we fail sometimes when we're blinded or we ignore what's right in front of us because we're so busy. Chaos, life just gets in the way, and we lose track of the path that you have set us on. God, help us to refocus, to refocus on you and your love and how you have called us to move beyond ourselves and into the world. God, help us to focus on a love that changes, a love that makes a difference, a love that is unconditional and filled with grace. And let us be a part of that story, a story that changes lives, a story that begins and ends with you, God. God, we ask all of this, in your holy, gracious name, as we 
are reminded that it is you who came down in human form. You came to teach us, to die for us, to resurrect for us. And in doing so, God, you taught us about prayer and what it means to pray for one another. And so we join together in that very same prayer today, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And it is not a temptation, but the rest of the we will stand and join together as we profess our faith and are reminded of what it is that we believe together. I believe in God, God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under the conscious Bible, was crucified, died, and was buried. He ascended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Bless you, keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and give you peace.